Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Maradian here in Washington, D.C., where we're covering the Satellite 2017 show. And we are over here at Viasat uh, to talk to Don Butchman, who is uh, the uh, Vice President for Commercial Mobility at Viasat. That's correct. Great, great to see you. Um, you guys uh, have built a reputation for sort of the 800-pound uh, gorilla of, of data, uh, data satellites. And I remember your uh, CEO, uh, Mark Denkberg, years ago sort of saying like, hey, you know, the kid that's sitting in seat 36 on a 737 heading somewhere in the country will have more broadband connectivity and streaming video capability than the Air Force One uh, will. And that vision is something you guys are realizing. Tell us how the game of in-flight entertainment and all of that is changing. You know, once upon a time, it was always the seat-back entertainment consoles, but increasingly, airlines are shifting to using, you know, for, for passengers to use their own devices because there's that connectivity. What's the outlook for that market for you guys? Yeah, it's really growing, so thanks for having me. Um, it's, you know, it's really changing the way the, the way the world's working. You know, Wi-Fi used to be just sort of get on, it was a sticker, 5 to 6% of the people used it, they paid for it, airline was okay with that. Then we sort of launched on JetBlue. And it really changed the game. Now everyone is online. They got a device. The iPhone came out, the iPad. Everyone wants to be online. And it's really changed. JetBlue gives away for free. Now it's, it's, it's a basic amenity. It's not just a luxury. And that's changing. And we're sort of seeing that with our next customers. They've changed the game. It's now become not just connectivity. It's not just sending a text message or checking an email. It's watching a movie on Netflix. It's, you know, internet has become entertainment. And we're sort of that that trend's happening in the ground. So there's no reason it shouldn't happen in an airplane as well. So we're, you know, our 800 pound gorilla satellites, as you talk about, you know, that's that's the whole thesis behind it. Is we just wanted to, we see there's gonna be ever ever reaching demand, and you need to have enough supply because if you run out, it's not good. Well, I mean, uh, I remember that um, in December we took a trip, and I had to spend fifty dollars on my one month uh, Wi-Fi pass. But flying recently, and this is not an endorsement nor a commercial, uh, but it was on JetBlue where we had you know sort of amber waves of connectivity to to a degree, which was really good because we're in the video uh, uh, we're in the video business. Um, tell us a little bit though about sort of the infrastructure you have and what kind of investments you guys are making to stay ahead of this, because obviously this is like a drug, right? The more bandwidth you have, the more bandwidth that you want. Well, sure, yeah. I mean, so Visat 1 launched in 2011 at 140 gigabits per second. Visat 2 is launching in April this year, so 2017 is going to have 300 gigabits per second. We've already announced the Visat 3 constellation, which will start launching in 2019. Each satellite is going to have over a terabit per second satellite, so for the same invested capital. So you can sort of see as we move up, we were the leaders by factor of 100 with Visat 1, and we didn't sit still with that lead. We, we know there's continued to move. The consumers, everyone is, wants to be connected around the world, and it's just going to be driving demand, and we have to keep ahead of that. You guys uh, had a recent acquisition of uh, Arconics, which is a software company. Tell us how that plays in your guys' strategy. Yeah, so, you know, as we said, we started with the back of the cabin, right? So that's kind of, a, the, in the in-flight world, sort of the, the airlines were able to make the case because the passengers are paying, the revenue bearing, let's give them amenity. So that's sort of, we started in the back. Arconics, what they bring to us is a connected aircraft. So they have electronic flight bags, they do document management on the ground, they integrate all of the airline from the ground operations to the airplane to the crew, all in the connected, and all they're missing was a connectivity piece. So that, that allows us to get more use out of the, the pipe for the airlines. So we're bringing more applications, more usefulness for the airlines, and Arconics is just a perfect fit to complement what we're already doing with our massive ba uh, broadband that we're bringing to the passengers. And, and But that is a competitive space, right? You guys have a number of major players in there. Uh, obviously, you know, Jeppesen was one of the guys, you know, certainly on the map-based thing that, uh, that, that's, that's there. But tell us a little bit about that competitive dynamic and how that market is evolving. Yeah, it really is. So there's a lot of happening in sort of the connected aircraft. Right now, I think no one's found that magical, you know, this is a killer app, right? So, you know, email, right? You know, who needs, you know, we had dial-up, so we did email, right? Then DSL came out, and then YouTube, and the cat video got born. We have the same thing now. We've got a lot of capacity coming off the airline, you know, to the airlines, but the maintenance, the operation guys, they haven't figured out what's that killer app. How am I going to save a million dollars? How am I going to save $10 million? And when they figure that out, that's when you get it really unearthed. So we started small. I think getting rid of the 20 pounds of documents and doing it on an iPad, you know, it's made the crew a lot more productive, you know, and easier to manage and get updated. And I think the airline operates better, and that's just going to keep evolving. Uh, and I want to just say for the record, not that there's anything wrong with it. I just never watched a 
cat video. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to lay that out there. Um, you guys have, uh, and I know that this was one of Mark's uh, cases that he would always try to take to the Pentagon is, hey, look, we, know we have all of this uh, bandwidth. You know, we have this capability that we can provide also to DOD. Uh, you know, in, in, instead of the investment, for example, in some purely military satellites, uh, certainly, you know, and you guys have been very good about how you share across that military uh, commercial line. Talk to us a little bit about how your side of the business and the defense side of the business are in this, you know, what, what you, you know, you guys have always tried to propagate is that virtuous cycle within the corporation yeah. to, you know, use this sort of loop and including enormous amounts of self-investment you guys put into this to remain ahead of the game. Yeah, it's, it's really is important. And again, you kind of come down to what are we fundamentally trying to, what problem are you trying to solve? And if it's connectivity and it's moving massive amounts of data in the most economic way, so you're trying to solve the same problems for commercial and government, so why wouldn't you have the same solution? You know, with the government, we do put on more things, you know, more security around it, uh, more tailoring it to their needs. But again, the asset's the same, and you can take advantage of that asset. And we've been really successful. I know I started off with a product into business jets. So it was the first broadband product for business jets back in 2002. And we invested it there, got it on Gulfstreams and Bombardier, and then moved that product over into the military side because they had the same need. They had they wanted broadband connectivity from very small antennas. And we solved that problem commercially, and the same problem needed to be solved on the government side, and they took advantage of it. And so it worked really well. We were able to make investments on one side and reap benefits on the other. And we continue to do that with, you know, with our consumer space and our satellites. Last question: Where do you expect a guy? Where do you expect from a from a commercial uh, as a commercial airline passenger? What kind of connectivity are folks going to have, say, five years from now or ten years from now? In a, from a, the, the passenger airlines, I mean, it should be uh, ubiquitous. It should be just like you're out in the street with 5G or 4G LTE. You should see the same thing. You shouldn't walk through an airplane and notice a difference. Your device, you should, you're interacting with your device in your car, in the lounge, in a taxi, in the terminal. You're going to interact with it just the same on the airplane. It's just going to be there, and it's going to be fast and ubiquitous, and you can do what you want to do. If I want to watch, catch up the latest ball game, I can watch it. If I want to watch the news, I can watch it. If I want to check my email, do web browsing, I don't think about it. I don't have to say, oh, I'm on an airplane. So let me just do text messages because everything else doesn't work. No. In fact, it's already happening today on JetBlue. You already have that experience, and we see that going throughout the industry. And gone are the days that you can actually get on an airplane and not be connected and actually have a chance to think. <laughs> well, it's your choice, right? There's still, there's, still will, there's still human willpower involved in that. So, <laughs> Bandwidth and willpower? What? <laughs> well, if, you, if people want to use it, they use it. If they don't want to use it, then you know, they'll put their device in a seat back. But I'm seeing more and more people kind of tethered to their device. So. I, I, was, I was kidding, Don. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can't tell you how many times I've actually reached and paid for that $6 a minute telephone call somewhere or more. So thanks very much. Okay, really appreciate you. it. Appreciate it. Thank you.